the Healing Through Love podcast with Charlene Lynch and Rose Davidson. In episode 128, learn trauma-informed leadership basics for compassion-driven support and empowerment with Tammy Vincent. Because when you, a lot of times, especially when you're a child, you, you, you dissociate. And when you dissociate, you kind of step out of your own body. And so you make up your own stories anyway. Mm. So if they're going to be, if you're going to make them up anyway, they might as well be good. I love it. But the other tip that I really like for NLP is called anchoring. So when something happens to you and let's just say something triggers you and it consistently makes you scared. So what you do is you, you picture the best thing in your life. Picture the word, I don't know, what's your favorite happy place, Charlene? Mine's the beach. <laughs> well, yes, I do love the beach, but also like the river because we live on the river. Yes. Okay. So picture that situation. And when you're picturing that situation, grab your ear or tap your knee, hold your knee real tight, right? If you do this over and over again, eventually, and it takes some practice, if something bad happens and you grab your knee, it will bring your mind right back to that happy place. Welcome to another episode of Healing Through Love. Each week, we share ideas, experiences, and resources to increase the awareness of domestic and family violence and to empower survivors to grow and thrive. We talk with experts who share their advice or with people who have experienced abuse, no matter where they are on their journey. This is all about healing through love. And now, here are your hosts, Charlene Lynch and Rose Davidson. Welcome to the Healing Through Love podcast, a space where stories of strength and resilience and transformation unfold. I'm your host, Charlene Lynch, and I'm honored to be your guide on this journey of empowerment and healing. Today, we have a very special episode tailored just for you, whether you're driving or sipping a cup of tea or simply taking a moment to yourself. I want you to know that you're in a safe place and healing through love is more than a podcast. It's a community, a beacon of hope, a reminder that you are not alone. In this episode, we have a guest who'll share their story that resonates at the core of our mission, a story that illuminates the power of love, resilience, and unwavering strength that lies within each and every one of us. So settle in and take a deep breath and let the healing journey begin. But before we dive into today's inspiring narrative, a quick reminder that if you find value in our episode, consider supporting us by subscribing, sharing, and leaving a review. Your engagement helps us reach the hearts and spread the message of healing with love. Today, we've got a very special guest with us. It's Tammy Vincent. She's a best-selling author, speaker, podcaster, transformational life coach, and NLP practitioner who has transformed her life after growing up with two alcoholic parents. Over the last 30 years of healing and education, Tammy leads others through self-reflection, self-love and empowerment. Hello and welcome to the podcast, Tammy, or should I say welcome back? It's great to see you. Yeah, absolutely, Charlene. It's so good to see you. I'm glad to be here today. It's great to connect. Now, some of our listeners might not necessarily know your story, and I I love to start our journey with just telling us a little bit about you and and why you're now paying it forward and making a difference for others. Okay. Well, I grew up in New Jersey with two parents who, let's just say it was a volatile relationship. They they were both drinkers. They were both into drugs. They, I just didn't have that love feeling growing up, if you can see. <laughs> and I really went on a journey. I mean, it was a long, long haul. And then I don't know if you've ever read that book, um, Love You Forever. And it's it's a children's book and it's about an unconditional love between a mother and her son. So in the book, the mom the is singing this song to her brand new baby and it's unconditional love. And she's like, I love you forever and ever and ever, forever and ever my baby you'll be. And she's singing it all through these stages of life. I mean, she's loving him no matter what he does. And at the very end, the tides are turned. 
everything's flipped and now she's old and frail and he's rocking her back and forth and he's singing, I love you forever, forever and ever. My mommy, you'll be. And I was seven months pregnant at the time with my first baby. And you would have thought that would have been the most joyous moment of my life. But it hit me like a two by four that I didn't un understand unconditional love. I, I just didn't even know what it was. I had never experienced it. I had never given it. And so I went on this journey. I went on this journey because obviously I had this little baby that I was about ready to have to take care of. And I had never felt those feelings. So I really dug in deep to figure out, you know, what is this thing love all about? I mean, really, it was like, I didn't know. And I did the only logical thing I could think of. I went out and I bought a puppy. Because I thought, <laughs> what a what a test of the human spirit to see if I was even capable of unconditional love. And let me tell you, it. For I was 26 years old. And when I held that little puppy in my hand, it was the first time in my life my heart had melted. So I was like, OK, that's my mission. I'm going to everybody should feel this. Everybody that has gone through the turmoil and the crap and the junk and the mess should still be able to feel this feeling. Mm -hmm. And that's why, I mean, it was, it's been a journey, let me tell you, but I have thrown everything at the wall I can think of to stick. And I just want people to know, you know, that there's something better on the other side, that there is love on the other side, that if we lead and, and have relationships with compassion and empathy for what people have gone through, the world is just gonna be a better place in general. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes. Uh, and look, I'm curious, as a woman who absolutely believes in forgiveness, where do you think forgiveness falls into this equation of the love and compassion and empathy? Um, forgiveness is very tough for many, many people. And it wasn't until I was an adult that I was actually able to forgive the people that hurt me because it was about them at that point. Until I turned it around and realized that forgiveness is really about me letting go of that anger and that animosity and that resentment and everything that was holding on to me, I wasn't going to be able to truly love anything. Honestly, I had to let go of those feelings and those emotions. And, you know, honestly, when you grow up in craziness like that, most of the people that hurt you either one, don't even know they hurt you or don't even understand the magnitude of what they did, or two, they've never asked for forgiveness. Mm. Nobody that hurt me ever came to me and said, hey, will you forgive me? But I was whole, it was still controlling me. So I had to just say, okay, Tammy, you're going to, you know, that was a bad situation. Those people were dealing with their own demons, fighting their own battles, winning or losing, it didn't matter. It had nothing to do with me. So- them personally. So I'm just going to let it go. I'm going to forgive. I'm going to put myself in their shoes and understand that whatever they did, they did it for their own reason, mm -hmm. but it had nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. And once I did that, and especially with my mother, who was probably my biggest abuser, um, it, the whole world looked different to me. Mm -hmm. I love it. It's so powerful, that central message of forgiveness. So in your journey and moving forward, uh, okay, yes, it started with the puppy. <laughs> well, it started with that <laughs> level of realisation that maybe you weren't equipped for this next part of the journey and then the then the puppy love. Uh, so what was your first dive into, like, which modality did you dive into first? Was it NLP? Um, no, actually, the first thing I did try was just going to regular talk therapy. I went to a psychotherapist and I just, I was like, I need help. I don't know what has gone on. And we started talking a little bit about my past. And so then I just told, happened to tell her something that had happened that day. And she was like horrified and it was just a normal part of my day. It had been a fight I had with somebody or something. And I was kind of cowering and doing what I typically do. And she's like, well, how did that make you feel? And I, I, at that point in my life, I can honestly say I was an empty shell. I didn't feel, I didn't feel happy, sad, angry, mad. I just, I had sucked up those emotions my whole life. So I was like, wow, I need some serious, like that was my, whoa, I really need some work. So I did, I started journaling and I'd always kind of journaled. My dad had always told me you should write a book. And so I had always had my private journals, um, 
but I really started journaling and I really started trying to be aware of, hmm, what's that feeling? What's, I don't, you know, anger. Like first time I said, that makes me angry. I think I was almost 28 years old. So I really, I started journaling was probably one of the biggest transformations ever. Um, Someone told me about inner child work. And anybody that has been through any kind of childhood adversity in a bad way that has changed the way they look at the world, inner child work is huge. It's getting back in touch with that hurt Mm five-year-old. Because when you're hurt as a child, it follows you into adulthood. And so I did a lot of writing letters to my six-year-old self, telling myself I was okay and I was safe and I was loved and, and hugging myself. And then writing letters back from that inner child. I used to have my, I used to use my other hand and I still do this actually, my other hand to write the letter back, my d- non-dominant hand and a couple reasons. Um, psychologists will say it's because it opens up the other side of your brain and you're going from left to right side of your brain. Um, I tend to believe that with me, when I was writing with my other hand, I was so focused on the letters that I was taking the ego out of it. So it does that make sense? Yeah. It's, well, and it probably it, did look like a five-year-old writing, just saying. No, it, well, it probably did look, yeah, it probably definitely looked like a five-year-old writing because it was sloppy, but I wasn't thinking about what I was supposed to be saying. I was actually focused on the letters and just writing. So when I would go back and read it, I was like, wow, that's interesting because I was trying to write it not from what I thought I needed to say, but what I actually wanted to say. And so I can say um, I went to hypnotherapy. So I'm just going through some of the modalities because, guys, if you're out there listening and you're struggling in any way, shape or form, the most the most exciting thing and the most exciting news is that you are at an age where we have resources available to us left, right, every which way. I mean, you just you can't even imagine that's with me. It was go to the library, sit down in a stack of 200 books and hope you find something that resonates. With you guys, with the people listening, it's podcasts, it's books, it's, you know, online therapy, online coaching groups, support groups, which is what you need. And over 30 years, I've tried pretty much everything. Um, But I can say the biggest transformation probably was the journaling and the inner child work as far as dealing with the past trauma, as far as dealing with your day to day. um, I did go through hypnotherapy. I do a lot of just meditation and grounding and just really trying to always live my life in the present. Mm. Um, Because what I've realized is, I mean, I talk a lot about anxiety and and anxiety is really 99% of it either comes from being stressed out because of your memory of something that happened in the past or anxious about something that could possibly happen because of your memory of something in the past. So, (laughs) right, right? you'll probably agree with me if you just focus on the right here and right now, this is where it's at and there is no past or or future. So it's in the moment and you have, you can make that moment everything you want it to be. I, I love it. I love it. Absolutely. For those who suffer from anxiety attacks, particularly just that process of being in the moment, you know, finding the five things that can just like snap you out of that pattern and help you just come back to reality. I love it. So powerful. So that you, you started to fall in love with the concept after you had a level of awakening that there was more because you had some therapy and then realized, oh, maybe everything's not as it should be. And then you start to dig through. So at what point in time did you fall in love with NLP? You know, I really, that was later in the process because I had kind of been doing, my mother was a child psychiatrist. So I read a lot of books and, and then I think it was like, I learned all these NLP practices, like reframing things. Like if I walked into a room and somebody raised their eyebrow at me and I thought, oh my gosh, they must not like me or they must be mad at me. I thought, Tammy, that's crazy. That is a made up idea in your mind based on something from the past. So NLP does a lot of things like reframing or rewriting stories and visualization. They have a, it's called neuro-linguistic programming for the people that have don't, have never heard of NLP. And there's very basics to it, but 
it's really changing the way using words and using your thoughts to really change your story. So taking that example, I'll give you an example. Oh, two things that are really powerful in NLP are reframing and anchoring. So reframing is when you literally just rewrite a story about something or look at it from a different perspective. So if you walk into a room and you're one of those people that's very self-conscious and somebody looks at you funny, it might not be anything about them, but you automatically assume it is because that's what you that's your trauma reactive world. You automatically assume it's you. So instead, I would look at somebody and I would make I would just say to myself, oh, they raised their eyebrow at me. Hmm. Maybe they have a bug on their face. And I'd always come up with something funny because humor always worked for me. So I'd be like, huh, maybe they got a bug under, you know, in their scalp or something and they're raising their eyebrow. So every time I would just give it a new meaning and I'm like, has nothing to do with me, has nothing to do with me. And then I would go home and journal about it and and see how I felt. But when you can put things in different perspectives, um, I'll take another example that people are like, how could you possibly think of this as a good thing? But my mom would, she we used to have, I had a horrible year when I was in preschool and there was a lot of just unpleasant things that happened to me. But one of them was I would co- consistently be locked in closets, consistently. And as an adult, I would, people like, how could you possibly think that that was a good thing? And I'm like, man, that closet, I it was my fortress. Like I convinced myself it was my fortress and I learned how to find food that I didn't even think existed. And I learn not to be afraid of the dark. And I would just have these fairy tale situations in this closet as an adult. And so that closet, all of a sudden it wasn't so bad. It was, it was just really, it's really just putting a whole new light and a whole new story on something bad. And the makings of the lion and the wardrobe. (laughs) Yeah, right. Exactly. I would, I used to laugh because people like how, what did you possibly learn from being locked in a closet? And I'm like, not afraid of the dark. I'm like, I can survive in very tight spaces. (laughs) Like like it was, I I don't know. It's like, I had to think, you have to think of the positive of everything. Mm -hmm. And NLP, I feel like that helps you do it. Um, Just re write, just re explaining the story in a different version. Um, Because when you, a lot of times, especially when you're a child, you, you, you dissociate. And when you dissociate, you kind of step out of your own body. And so you make up your own stories anyway. Mm. So if they're going to be, if you're going to make them up anyway, they might as well be good. I love it. But the other tip that I really like for NLP is called anchoring. So when something happens to you and let's just say something triggers you and it consistently makes you scared. So what you do is you you picture the best thing in your life. Picture the word. I don't know. What's your favorite happy place, Charlene? Mine's the beach. <laughs> well, yes, I do love the beach, but also like the river because we live on the river. Yes. OK, so picture that situation. And when you're picturing that situation, grab your ear or tap your knee, hold your knee real tight. Right. If you do this over and over again, eventually and it takes some practice If something bad happens and you grab your knee, it will bring your mind right back to that happy place. So you anchor a specific thing, whether it's grabbing your ears, you know, rubbing your head, whatever that action is, you can literally connect a positive thought to that. And that is one of my most powerful because people can be in some pretty scary situations and all of a sudden they grab their knees and close their eyes and take not even half a breath and they're back at the beach or they're back at the river. So mine's my mum patting my head and what I do is I twirl my hair and that reminds me of my mum patting my head. Yeah. Oh, okay. See, (laughs) but that's, it brings you back. So if you're stressed out and someone's making you whatever crazy and you're staring at them through their soul and you're thinking other stuff, you just do that and it brings you right back to that happy place. It's a beautiful coping mechanism. I love it. I love it. It's fabulous. Uh, Tammy, this is great work. I love it all. And I noticed that you really concentrate on a more holistic, integrated approach to, to how you heal. So so you've got the NLP and the journaling and the reframing. So what else do you bring into this integrated approach that covers not just the mind, but the body and also the soul? Um, I also do a lot of essential oils. I am a firm believer in them. Yes. Amen. Um, I, I love them. I 
I help people. What I do is I help people get off these mind altering medicines and these body altering medicines. And just by calming, it's so the, because it's really about calming that nervous system and essential oils are amazing. A little bit of lavender can really literally drop your cortisol levels like 25%. I use a lot of, um, a lot of lavender. I do a lot of, um, besides the essential oils, I do a lot of meditation. Mm -hmm. And for people that are listening that go, oh, I don't know how to meditate because I've heard that all the time. You know, especially I have people that are ADHD that are like, I can't meditate. And I'm like, walk down your street and look at the sky. That is meditating. Count the clouds. That is meditating. It's anything that is bringing you to the present so, cause a lot of people don't, they're like, I can't sit still. You know, they picture the Buddha and they picture the legs crossed, which I can't do because I have bad knees and they picture the, Ooh. you know, that is not like all meditating is about. Although I have to tell you when you hum, it is very, very, very calming on your whole system. They say one of the most calming exercises during meditation or even not is two breaths in and then Ooh, that that stimulating your vagus nerve goes right to your belly, calms your whole system. Just that's another little tip. <laughs> I do like, you know, breath work. It is fantastic. Everyone can do it and it's free. Uh, mm -hmm. I just think that there's so many modalities and I'm an advocate for moving away from anything that is drug related. And um, because really, <sighs> look, the horror stories are just my stepfather it was cured of cancer and died from the medication that they gave him to cure him from cancer. So he still died, but he didn't, he died cancer free. So I've mm. never really, um, I've never really lent into them. Yes. And I've had my dalliances with them uh, along with addiction, but um, yeah, it's been more than a decade now that I've been free of everything, including coffee and red meat and everything else in between. And the difference is I swear that you can vibrate at a higher frequency because oh, there's, yeah. there's nothing between. It's just it's just you're purely connected to source. And uh, I love it. I love the journaling. I love especially writing a letter to your younger self and then answering it back with the other hand. I think that's spectacular. And uh, I, I love the reframing. So so what's next for you moving forward? Um, you know, just continuing on my journey, but I just want to help people understand that if there's a if they're not where they want to be. You know, I always, I, a psychologist said it one time and I, I don't remember who it was, but I love this test. If you just sit to yourself and you say, and Charlene, you'll like this one because you, you're kind of, you like those funny things, but say to yourself, picture your favorite food, whether it be ice cream, pizza. Well, it's not pizza for you probably, but mangoes. I don't know. Picture your favorite food. And how does that make you feel? Nom, 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 nom. <laughs> right. Warm, fuzzy, happy, right? Now say to yourself, I deserve all good things. I deserve all good things. And if you get a little clench in your belly or a tension in your back or your shoulders go up, you might not believe that. And that is my mission. That is my mission that everybody I come in contact to when they say I deserve all good things, that they are truly at a point in their life that they believe it. So mm -hmm. until like, you know, because sometimes we don't. And if we if we go, mm, if we get a pit in our belly. There's more work to do and there's a better, there's a happier you, not even a better you because you're perfect the way you are, but there's a happier you. I love it. And that. that is my mission. So I'm, I speak, I coach, I do anything I can do to get out there and just share that word. I love it all. I love it all. Now, we before the show, we were talking about trauma and trauma informed and, um, you know, whose responsibility is it to be trauma informed? And, um, and, you know, as a survivor myself, enabling myself to move forward was all about me taking responsibility for my own thought processes and the words that were coming out of my mouth and, and the things that I was doing. But uh, going before I got to that process, I was in the company of other people that ne weren't necessarily treating me as well as I could have been because I was still going through trauma. And I suppose we all are in some fashion or another. So talk to me about trauma informed and where does that fit into society? Who who needs to who needs to know? Who needs to know? 
Well, you know, it would be nice if everybody knew because really being trauma informed is literally just doing nothing more than having compassion for human beings and trying to have a little empathy and maybe thinking that everything's not great with them. So it's really, it's everybody, everybody should be trauma informed, but the basics, like if you've, if you're a leader in any kind of position, you are dealing with people that are not at their best in productivity or reactivity because they're going through this. So they're, you know, so leaders in general, like if you walk into work and you've got six people that are completely triggered by anger or lack of boundaries or, you know, bullies or having too many tasks and overwhelm, it makes the workplace not work as well. It just makes things not go as smoothly. So Mm -hmm. if you, if you're as a leader or as a teacher or as a professor or whatever it is, or as a parent, I mean, whatever it is, if you notice that somebody is maybe not making good eye contact or they're afraid of authority, you know, you tell them something that could seem like constructive criticism and they take it so personally, they have a meltdown or they withdraw um, or they're, they're nervous. Some people shake, some people have difficulty concentrating. It's just they're in this reactive state. If you recognize that, then you can kind of change your tone maybe. You know, if someone comes in and they look upset instead of saying, what's wrong with you? Which, I mean, how many times do we say that to people? What's wrong with you? And I mean, it's like, dang, like, wow, I just got stung by a bee. Like, you don't have to make it so like I'm a bad person. But that's, you know, that's our thinking. So Instead of what's wrong with you, maybe be more compassionate and say, hey, what's going on with you? What's happening with you? Just those that shift in words right there can take someone from a scared point of scared, being scared to all of a sudden trusting that maybe you care a little bit about them. Mm, It's so it's so true. And if the entire world could just lean into that level of curiosity and find out it's not about you, it's about them. (laughs) What could we do to make it better for other people? And just that energy exchange, doing nice things for other people, it makes it better for us too. Like we're both, everybody wins. Um, yeah, yep, yeah, I, I understand. I get it. I love it. I love it. It's a great conversation. I love this. And uh, now if people want to know more about what it is that you do and how they can connect to you, um, where, where do they go? Probably the best thing is just to my website. It's just my name, TammyVincent.com. And you can reach out to me. I love to chat with anybody. Um, I have links to my podcast on there. I have pretty much everything on there that you need. And you can find, I can get you to the right resources. If I don't have them, I will find them for you, for sure. Uh I love this. I love this. If you're listening today and you're a survivor of family and or domestic violence, we have Pamper Days. Think Day Spa on steroids, where you come along for free and we have practitioners just share the love with you because they can. Think hairdressers, skincare, makeup, uh, chakra aligning, you name it, uh, massage, it's all there. And mostly we have about between 15 to 25 practitioners at each event. And we've got these happening locally and also abroad as well. So Healing Through Love as of 2023 has gone global and we're excited to be offering these around the world. So reach out to Healing Through Love and we'll tell you where the closest pamper day is for you. If you're listening today and you're a practitioner, we are looking for more practitioners to help us pay it forward and make a difference to others. Reach out to Healing Through Love. We'd love to have a conversation. This is fantastic, Tammy. I could talk with you all day. Uh, In closing today, what are your words of wisdom for our audience? Remember every single day that you are the amazing creature that God created you and you're perfect just the way that you are and feel proud in that and walk strong in that because you deserve it. I love that. I love that. Tammy, as always, it's great to connect and I hope that you come back again soon. It's a privilege and pleasure to share your proximity. It's a goodbye from me and a goodbye from Tammy. Bye. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Healing Through Love. You can get further resources, see the show notes, or simply reach out to us via our website at htlaustralia.org. Thanks so much for joining us, and we look forward to your company next time on the Healing Through Love podcast.